All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today again yeah, um, about recursion schemes, but also generally about functional programming in data lakes and how it's sometimes kind of terrible. So uh, quickly, who I am, because uh, this is my first time doing this. I have been doing Scala for about two years now. Uh, more or less serious FP for one, so just kind of as a reference point. Um, first things first, uh, thanks for, for Chris for his uh, previous talk on recursion schemes, so I don't have to do an entire introduction. Um, thanks for Chris to um, encourage me to do this talk in the first place, to Valentin Cosos, uh, Pavel and Greg for their help, and thanks my better off for the design. So uh, quickly for me as a reference point, how many Scala devs are actually here? Okay, <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, how many of you have worked with Spark? Okay, and Avro? All right, okay, good. So in, in big data, it's a thing that you kind of, 90% of the time you need to get data from point A to point B. So the question about serializing that data and doing so in a sensible way and in a flexible way and in a powerful way is an important one. And like many people that work in, in with Hadoop stacks or around distributed systems, I, um, I looked at Avro to do this. And, you know, it seems shiny and reasonable and um, it has really, really good parts. Like it supports quite powerful schemas. Um, it has a very good binary representation. It also supports the JSON representation. For example, if your source systems do not support Avro as a first class library, you can just send some weird JSON thing and it'll still work out. Um, it also has very good container files that, that are self-describing and are already intended to be used on distributed file systems. But, um, and that's kind of the whole thing with the anglerfish, um, it also has quite a few nasty teeth. Um, if at some point any of you that worked with Avro had the distinct pleasure of using its um, org Apache schema class or, or the generic record, you probably know what I'm talking about and that's kind of the point of this talk in all. That um, Avro is just an example, but it's a, a very good one for the state of, of big data development. Um, for FPers in general that, you know, there's some good parts, but mostly also quite a few nasty teeth. Um, so rather than just kind of complaining about it all day, I decided to, whenever I, in frustrations, throw up my hands and start rewriting everything from scratch, I'm gonna put it on this repo here um, for my personal reuse, for my company's reuse, and maybe yours if, um, if you want to do that. Um, so PRs, issues, and feedback, welcome. Have fun looking at it. So just to kind of motivate where this even is all coming from, we had this use case where we built something like kind of parcel tracking. So you have an ID for some parcel that is being sent from A to B, and um, it was represented on, on just a regular old Oracle or Postgres database, uh, but it was on a view and this view had something like 350 columns and, and many, many, many reading applications. But most applications were really only interested in a very small subsets of the columns that were, were even available. Um, so this wasn't really a good fit for, for a classical database at all. So um, we were tasked to fix that and um, we pretty quickly decided to use um, a technology called HBase, and I'm gonna, gonna explain that in a second, um, to, to use that because that's what HBase is really good at. Uh, but we still had the open question, how do we get the, the data from the database into HBase? So quick interlude, um, HBase is basically a key value store. Um, it has really, really good random access properties. If you read for a specific key or write for a specific key, it's also very good at sub-selecting kind of columns, even though it doesn't really have columns underneath. Um, so if you use or need to use something like that, but it also actually has a lot of kind of nasty teeth, so bear that in mind. Um, so to get it actually from this huge view, 
into HBase, um, we decided to use Kafka, which is also a very common technology. I'm also going to mention what Kafka is for those that you, of you that don't know, and the schema registry. And the schema registry is a really simple REST service where you take an ORO schema, you put it in there, and then you can call it by ID rather than having to embed the whole schema for every record you send on ORO. So Kafka, Kafka is basically just a distributed log or a message queue. That's what it's mostly used for. Very common technology in, uh, in Hadoop stacks. Um, much like HBase, both those do not have an inherent concept of schemas for data. So you're kind of responsible to do that yourself. They just give you bytes. So now we actually get to finish out what the use case was, is maybe a quick explanation and quick show and tell how such an overall schema looks. So the DB server basically, and that was a very important requirement that the DB server has to have the authority on new schemas. So they need to be able to send us a new schema, send us the new data, and we have to be able to ingest it and put it into HBase in a, in a, reasonable, in a reasonable format. And this is, this is how this was supposed to be done by just basically putting a schema out there. Here we have four fields, and the only real notable thing here is the last field, which is using a union to represent an optional type. So in Avro, the null type is a type with a single inhabitant, that being null. And if you need to um, represent an optional field, you can do that by just saying, well, it's null or whatever type you want it to be. Um, now, since HBase doesn't quite deal very well with nested data structure, and you don't want to have that anyways because you want that fast lookup, we had the requirement that any incoming schema has to be flat. So no nested records, unions only consisting of null and uh, one further primitive. Because we didn't want to have to encode like tagged unions or anything in HBase. So, and how this kind of runs through Kafka is that you have an envelope format, which just carries along the schema ID which you got when you registered the schema at the schema registry. So this saves us of having to send the schema information time and time again with each record. Um, this is also like in the payload, you see the, um, this is what the JSON representation of an overall value would look like. It's pretty self-explanatory, except for a union case. And there what you basically have to do is you provide a single object and in that object, the, the, there is a single property, and that property has to carry along the type name um, for the union member you want to have your, your value encoded as. So you, you might see where this is going, because overall it turns out, much like JSON itself, is a highly nested data structure, even allowing you to formulate like, inductive types like linked lists or whatever you want. And um, for for that kind of recursive structures, recursion schemes are quite a good fit. So one of the things we want to do as functional programmers is probably employ pattern matching because that's a really good way to, to take this like huge ADT and take it apart. And again, uh, that's something that Apache, the reference implementation of Apache overall doesn't give us it being written in Java. Um, for the use case I was working at, we had to do a structural analysis to figure out how we can do this um, kind of requirement of flatness and no re nested records, right? And again, to do structural analysis, pattern matching is just kind of a natural fit and is a good tool to do. And the usual FP line applies that we want to write software that we can reason about very well and we can ensure a higher degree of correctness um, rather than just kind of hoping that stuff works. So there is now, now, now is the spooky part because we get, we get in to dig into the Java representation of things and look at the recursion schemes I employed and all that fun stuff uh, to figure out that there is actually a better solution to this. So this, and you don't have to read it all, uh, this is the, the schema representation, or actually the generic record representation of 
that Java uses for any generic record in Avro. And you might spot the, the issue here that your values are just an array of objects. So what you're forced to do is you take its schema, you look up the field position of the field you want, and then you look up its type, and then you figure out what you have to typecast the array value as, and then you hope nothing explodes, and that's kind of terrible to work with. So this is just kind of a show and tell, because the previous slide was just the generic record, right? This is the complete ADT that I wrote for any schema representation as well as any generic value representation, and it barely fits on one slide, but it does, so um, that's already kind of a plus there. Um, so when you get to the point where you actually need to take apart these um, this references and you have to typecast all these objects, you have to do a lot of digging to actually figure out what Avro itself uses in memory to talk about their types. So this is a list I found on Stack Overflow as well as kind of compiled myself. And um, a, a lot of the stuff is straightforward. The primitives are just ints and, and booleans are just booleans. For string, they decided to use their own thing uh, that you can subtype, which probably would blow my entire thing up. But you can if you want. I haven't seen a use case ever making use of this, though. Uh, for bytes, it uses a byte buffer. Um, enums and enums, arrays, maps, fixed, which is just a fixed length byte array. And uh, those have their own representation. And the, the ones that are in generic data actually carry along the schema information. Everything else doesn't. So you just kind of have to blindly guess what it is. My personal favorite is union, because what you get when you retrieve a union field is just an object. That's, that's all they know. And then you just kind of have to figure it out from there. So <laughs> this is a bit dated code. It actually looks much cleaner now. Uh, but I, it, it shows the issue very well, because when you have to decode a union, what you end up doing is you know that you have a union schema, and you have some object that is supposed to be one of the values, or ha should be one of the memory representation that your union allows for. But you have no clue which one. And the generic representation of, of Avro, having no wrapper for it, doesn't tell you at all. So you have to do, go the other way, take the object, do a pattern match against is it, is it null? Is it a Boolean? Is it a float? Is it a double? And you just go through all the allowed representation that an that overall generic value can have. And then once you have figured that out, you go back to your schema and look if that's actually a member of your schema to make sure it's a valid entry. So um, if you have to do any sort of structural analysis with, with the reference implementation, and you, you have to use that, um, Good luck if there are unions. However, um, so the, the library I wrote actually kind of consists of two parts. One, one gives you first class access to use directly JSONs, and it works from, from just a JSON uh, pattern functor and from there. That's kind of clean, but I also offer um, interop libraries to use the generic data types that, that Avro already gives you. Sadly, this leads to some very wonky type signatures and the use of any, um, partially because, because Scala doesn't quite have the features yet required to, to express these kinds of type signatures. So, but again, there is a silver lining. So besides the whole Avro thing, I also, um, just a week ago actually, uh, got around to, to doing the whole thing for JSON as well. And that's really cool because what you end up with is you have your, your JSON tree and you can directly using Matryoshka and using recursion schemes, take that recursive data and, and transfer it into, into a schema or transfer it into a value. Uh, this uses Cersei uh, underneath um, and I kind of hope and aim to, to offer binary support later. Um, so this is, this is kind of what it, what it looks like. 
um, with the JSON-F, it's still a bit scary because it turns out you kind of have to, to model parser state uh, because if you have a JSON object, you don't actually know whether it's a, a overall record field definition or it's a record definition or anything else that can be represented as a JSON object. So you have to carry along these, um, these parser context objects, which leads to a bit of tricky type signature. But it's still much, much, much better than having an any somewhere stuck in there and does still having to do some scary type casting at the end of the day. Now, if you get to actually parsing records, it gets much cleaner because you really just get um, your, your overall value back there. And this is an example of what we mentioned, or what was mentioned in the previous talk of, um, of a monadic fold, uh, though not using an algebra M, but rather using this encoding that you actually fold your entire thing into a function. Um, yes. So, now this is kind of all the machinery I wrote. Um, now we can look at the use case code. And again, the use case, what, was I, what I described before this um, reading from Kafka and then writing it into HBase without actually knowing what the data looks like, rather doing this just schema driven with some small config that you need, like a key field or, or whatever. And um, I did this using FS2, uh, which was kind of cool because FS2 actually um, has Kafka bindings and um, I haven't used the FS2 before, so that was really cool to test this out. And this is kind of the meat of it. This is kind of the same steps I outlined before, right? So we read, we read the JSON message, we take it apart, so we have the ID and we have the payload. We retrieve the, the schema from the registry. Uh, these are all final tagless algebras behind. Um, and then we parse the schema. We parse the, the value. And then we refold this back down, right? So because what we have to do is now we have this huge overall ADT, but what that we can't just put this into HBase. Rather, we have to encode it into what amounts to a, a binary map with, with a key and some number of cells that have a name and have a, a byte value. And this is kind of that part. And um, we just pass in basically the key field uh, that we expect it to have as well as the unfolded ADT. So, and if we look at, at, at actually this full typed wrapper function, uh, there is an algebra within. And this is really the meat of it. And Matryoshka and recursion schemes are not the easiest technology to under understand, so this might be a bit puzzling on the, on the first look. But uh, we heard about paramorphisms in the previous talk, and this is what is actually using here, because paramorphisms gives, uh, gives us access to previously folded, the previously folded structure and allows us to inspect it for any nested records. And for the primitives, this is super simple, right? We just, we just, we get a primitive. We already have the value there, thanks to pattern matching. And all we have to do is wrap it in our structure. We give it an, a, a cell name, which is just its type, like just a synthetic uh, name. And this is just for all the primitives or anything else that, that is actually terminal. So it doesn't have any further nesting further down. Um, this is also the case for enums because they just end up being strings. And the same for fixed, which is just a fixed length byte array. Um, for unions, for unions it's, it's a bit more tricky because in our initial requirement we said that you are only allowed to use unions to express optional types. So we kind of have to go through our union members, uh, which is a list of types, and we have to look if they are, if they are the, the, the allowed ones. So only a null plus one other primitive. And if that's the case, we, we use basically the same encoding as we use for the primitives. If it's not, we raise an error. Now there's also non-terminal um, data structures there. So anything that actually has further nesting um, down, downstream, and that would be the records, it would be like arrays, maps, 
and all that things. And for those, we need to do a bit more a clever thing because we need to make sure that our, our cell names in HBase are actually collision free. So what we do is we just prefix, prefix the keys. So if you have an, an int array with like 10 elements, you will get array zero dot int, array one dot int, array and so forth and so forth. For the maps, we do the same thing, but rather using an index, which is used the, the key of the field itself. Now, this is the, the tricky part, and actually the part why, why we need um, why we need a paramorphism at all. So, in the ADT I formulated, each element actually carries along its its schema. Um, it's schema definition. So even if you have like a generic record, you always know what was the original definition that was used to decode that. And we can use this here to make sure that if we look at all the fields in a record, that none of the fields has a further record in it, right? Because that would lead to nesting and possible recursion and all the other things that we can't really put into HBase in a sensible way. So we formulate this algebra and then we just go over all the, the fields in the record and make sure there is no, no further records in there. And again, if it is um, indeed all right, we just put it in our structure, return it, and it's good, else we raise an error. And right at the end, and here you see actually the call to paro m, which is the, the monadic variant of the paramorphism, um, which is, we, we get then this back these prefixed entries, which is just a list of HBase cells, which is just a name and a byte array. And then we extract the key field that we expect. So we have a proper row key on HBase. And we create an HBase row, which we then write right into the database. So this whole thing, though, it's still very heavily work in progress. I am, I am going to use this actually next month on a, on, a, on a project, but I just actually put it out there um, um, a couple days ago. And recursive schemas, recursive schemas turn out to be actually kind of hard to do without shooting yourself in the foot um, and causing, for instance, infinite recursion or not being able to detect them and just having a general pain. So they work with the JSON representation. They don't work if you if you are stuck on the on the on the Java representation. Uh, it's the same for schema references because it's kind of the same problem. Uh, default values, which is a thing that Avro can do, um, Anglerfish can't yet. Um, logical data types, same thing, but, but that's a pretty easy thing. Performance, I actually don't know. I haven't, I haven't measured it. I haven't done any benchmarking yet, but it's probably terrible. Um, <laughs> so um, there is also some questionable decisions. You have seen some pretty wonky um, type signatures before and really, really complicated ones. And I am trying to, to somehow abstract this away and make it much more approachable because generally you don't want to expose this too far to the API users. So the, my whole goal for this, this library is that over maybe the next month, I will address most of the things that I just outlined in the, in the VIP section and hopefully get to start tackling a couple more features. Uh, one major thing is the binary representation because the JSON representation is only really used if you don't have another choice. So again, if you, if you, got, if you have to to access a source system that doesn't have these binary encodings necessary for Avro, you use JSON, but rather you would use the binary one. Um, a very sorely needed refactor, um, I spent the last week kind of hacking away at this furiously, and uh, there is quite some stuff that I need to clean up, um, as well as much better support for the JSON pattern functor, because surprisingly I haven't found a, a printed one anywhere, so I decided to make my own and also put it into, into Anglerfish and I would like to eventually offer some more sophisticated features around that. So um, that's kind of it. Um, one last absolute shameless plug. Um, I work for Scikit-Learn. 
and they kind of were kind enough to send me here and pay my bills. So there is our slide. Um, yeah, thanks for listening to me. <laughs>